Alaska is big. It's a fifth the size of the entire contiguous U.S., over two times the size of Texas, but with only a fraction of the people. Generations of artisans, builders, and scientists alike have found inspiration in Alaska's wild, open spaces, leaving their mark on destinations across the state. Atlas Obscura has collected thousands of curious and fascinating places across the globe, each one with its own incredible history, each one a new story to be told. These are four of those stories. Goose Creek Tower looks like it was dragged straight out of a fairy tale. Created by a poet slash lawyer who found an almost religious inspiration in the Alaskan wilderness, construction on the rambling stronghold began over 20 years ago. The tower has grown without a specific plan or purpose, and it might not be done just yet. My name is Philip Paul Widener. I live in Alaska. I'm the owner and the builder of Goose Creek Tower. I actually also built my own home. Um, it was a little bit of an inspiration for Goose Creek Tower. The other inspiration was the Gaudet Cathedral in Barcelona, Spain. They're still working on that, and they worked on it for about 125 years. And in fact, uh, my children and my grandchildren may have to actually finish it. But the way I've designed it and built it, barring some catastrophe, and I hate to even talk about a catastrophe, um, it should stand for at least a thousand and maybe a couple thousand years. I'm a little bit of a frustrated architect. I mean, I, I studied engineering. I'm also from a family of builders that is farmers, building barns and things of that nature. So even though I went to MIT and studied engineering and used some of my education in building the tower, I really built it like a farmer would. We didn't have any plans. Uh, we just built it as we went and actually it evolved as we went. And, we, and, and at each stage, we'd just draw it out on cardboard or plywood or even in the dirt uh, and decide where to go next. People often ask me why did I do it or why am I doing it and the answer is simply because I wanted to and I can. But it also gives me a connection to the universe and I often refer to it as a poem to the sky. I write poetry. I crossed my bee in Rubicon when I first tasted light at morning kiss of La Vidon from out the welcome night. Pray say each day, each thought beat breath along the cosmic way, on ethereal road from myth of birth to mirage of death, la vida dies begins. Essa life spark fire flame, be so lit, so ends. Flares surges, withers, wanes. Say so, so doth my eye of eye, with each tick tock of cosmic clock, be so spawned, so too doth die. As Mobius shift shapes of entropy, carousel cusp of energy, kaleidoscope visions of to be, on air shifting state of la vie, so with eternal mystery, so flows, so flies by, with ancient room of why of why. Down a tight side street in Juneau, Alaska, there's an incredible museum dedicated to preserving the history of Alaska and its people, one doll at a time. The museum holds one of the world's most diverse collections of indigenous dolls, featuring figures not just from Alaska, but also from distant regions such as Scandinavia and Siberia. Aunt Claudia's Doll Museum is home to hundreds of figures, made by hand and crafted by tradition. My name is Mary Ellen Frank, and I am a doll artist and a curator and director of Aunt Claudia's Dolls in Juneau, Alaska. Claudia's, her doll collection, it wasn't like one of those doll collections that kids couldn't touch. She was always willing to have kids come out and she was like more than willing to have them touched and played with and enjoyed. So I think she, she was full of uh, joy and sharing. 
And when I finally did connect with Claudia and B uh, through a mutual friend, they were just a, a real rich part of my life. I took a two-week workshop with a uh, Eskimo doll maker who was doing a solo show and um, I just loved it. For one thing, uh, dolls outlast us and um, they communicate beyond us. What they communicate is an image of what we thought we were or maybe wanted to be. Um, I think they are the ones that are, are telling us something. They take you through so many different kinds of art as you make them. There's just so much information in Alaskan dolls, but in all kinds of dolls. The posture, the size, the proportion. I think that the people who are from the culture or from the area, everything about the doll is saying something about what their self-image is. The Yupik or Inupiat dolls that were actually made by Yupik or Inupiat people uh, and see the differences in them and uh, see what they're trying to convey. And to see that over time uh, is just is, is fascinating and it, uh, it, it does communicate something. Um, like a snapshot. Not every story is one of success and achievement. The Moldering Dome, once known as Igloo City, is a testament to the mad ambitions that Alaska's unforgiving wilderness can inspire. Still unfinished, its remains tease a second life that will probably never come. The Igloo City project was the dream of World War II vet Leon Smith, who began work on the site in the 1970s. Smith imagined Igloo City as a hotel and highway attraction with its own general store and gas station. Roughly halfway between the cities of Anchorage and Fairbanks, on the edge of Denali State Park, you can still find the imposing shell of Smith's doomed novelty igloo. Inside, small rooms would have linked to a center atrium, creating a feeling of warmth and coziness against the wilderness outside. But the grand opening never came and only the local wildlife have ever had the chance to take refuge there. Igloo City was plagued with construction and structural issues. It failed to meet building codes, and Smith was never able to acquire the capital necessary to get his project back on track. He eventually managed to sell the property and his unfinished folly just before his death in 1999. The new owner tried to operate a small gas station and some cabins on the site, but these endeavors didn't fare any better than Smith's, and they closed down in the early 2000s. Today, the owners don't have the funds or the will to continue working on it. And while the iconic exterior has been standing for over 40 years, the inside has deteriorated from decades of freezing and thaw. The structural flaws that supposedly led to problems with the building's approval have only multiplied. It's unlikely that Igloo City will ever see guests, but when you visit the site, it's hard to ignore what could have been. But in case, like Smith, you can't resist the call, it's for sale for just $300,000. The call of the Alaskan wild doesn't only sing to artists. Fairbanks, Alaska's permafrost research tunnel was created in the 1960s to test whether the perpetually ice-bound soil could even be broken. But the tunnel continues to prove itself to be far more fascinating than they could have imagined. My name is Gary Larson. I'm the facility manager for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Cold Regions Research Engineering Laboratory Permafrost Tunnel. When I came to work for Corral, the reason they hired me was because they needed a bureaucrat because all of the big brain researchers aren't very good at budget and contracting. And so they decided to hire someone to take care of those things and help them be successful. I'm trying to interpret what we see inside the tunnel and relate that to 
uh, uh, issues and concepts that uh, uh, are familiar to the general public. When you first step into the tunnel, I think most people are expecting to see an ice tunnel, uh, ice covering the walls, and, and that's not exactly what you see. When you first walk in, what you notice is that you're seeing mostly frozen silt blown in off the glaciers off of the Alaska Range somewhere between about 45,000 years ago and about 10,000 years ago. It contains roots, it contains a lot of gravel layers, uh, it contains uh, also uh, prehistoric bones. The, the bones are uh, from the late Pleistocene, the animals that lived here in Fairbanks area probably 10 to 15,000 years ago. Um, they're not old enough to have fossilized and so they're still considered all to be bones. The tunnel is actually uh, an excavation that's about 100 meters. It was created in 1963 to demonstrate that you could dig in permafrost soils uh, as a way of of storing material and protecting military stuff. Quickly thereafter, as soon as they completed the experiment, they realized that it was a wonderful laboratory, a wonderful research facility. And so uh, my organization, Cold Regions Research Engineering Laboratory, quickly took over management and have been managing as a research facility ever since. NASA, like many other organizations, have done research in the tunnel many times. The tunnel is a wonderful example of what long-term frozen ice features look like. And so uh, NASA felt that the tunnel was a wonderful analog for what they were seeing on Mars. NASA was taking samples from ice wedges within the tunnel, and when they took the samples back to the lab, they were amazed to find out that bacteria that had been frozen in the permafrost for 25,000 years reanimated. If the climate continues to warm here in interior Alaska and most of the permafrost were to thaw, it's very possible that the tunnel might be the last remaining uh, bit of permafrost because we artificially refrigerate it. These are just some of the wonders that can be found down Alaska's back roads, tucked away in its hidden corners. Every state, every place, has so much to explore. And wherever you are, there are stories just waiting to be discovered. To find more curious stories and hidden wonders, click the button to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Tell us in the comments what state you think we should look at next.